Okay, everyone, thank you for being here. I know we have a lot of events on campus today that we are quote unquote competing with. So I appreciate your, your presence and your attention and I expect we'll have some other um, people coming in as we chat. So please excuse them. Also, please be reminded that we have food over here including Girl Scout cookies that I don't want to bring home. So please eat those. Um, we have a lot of paperwork up here for you if you are interested. One of the um, pieces of paper that's available to you is, is scheduled for the remaining sessions in the workshop series. We have one more workshop and a campus-wide lecture left to go um, after today. And the campus-wide lecture, please be reminded that it is open to students and anybody on campus. So if you want to offer extra credit or however you want to sweeten the deal so that um, our students will come and, and join the conversation with us, that would be wonderful. Also relevant to what we're going to be talking about today, and I'll make mention of these, um, we have these uh, handouts that are um, about universal design. So one of them is about uh, universal design in our learning centers. So uh, that's relevant to those of you who are tutors or hear from the various learning centers that we have on campus. And then we have this other um, handout that is about implementing universal design in um, the design of your courses. I'm sure that the lessons in this can also be um, used by our tutors as well. So all this material is here for you, please um, help yourselves uh, throughout the workshop to that too. Good? Okay. All right, so here we are at our second workshop of this series, Diversity Project Development Funded um, fun funded series, um, Engaging Faculty and Tutors in the Success of Community College Students with Disabilities. Uh, we had one, one um, session of the series about a month ago where we talked about the ADA and also about Asperger's and autism. We have our series today where our focus will be on compliance and inclusive courses, universal design for learning and assistive technology. And then we also have another workshop and a lecture to go as I mentioned before. The order of the speakers today is going to be um, Myself, Amy Traver, I'm a faculty member in the Social Sciences Department here, and I'm going to talk a little bit about universal design, which is a relatively new topic for me. I'm learning right along with you, so this is um, some exciting material for me to wrap my head around as well. Um, then we'll have Johnny Nelson from LaGuardia Community College who is the director of the um, Students with Disabilities there. I think it has a different name though, right Johnny? Office for, Students and Disabilities. Office for Students. Thank you for being here. And then we have University Assistant Dean Chris Rosa who's here with us today too and both of them will be sharing comments with you after I conclude. And then we have our own Carlos Herrera of SSD here and some of his team who are going to talk to us a little bit about um, the various assistive technologies Technologies that we have available to faculty and students on campus. Okay, so I'll jump in. So most faculty and students and tutors approach student learning with one model in mind and it's a model that actually provided the foundation of our first workshop together and it looks a little bit like this. We have our entire student population here at Queensboro. We have those students who self-identify and register with the relevant office, Service for Students with Disabilities. And then some of those students working in concert with the office actually receive individualized academic accommodations. So again, this is the model under which we do most of our work. This is the model under which we approach our students as faculty members, our students as members of the various learning centers. What we're going to do today is flip this model a little bit. Okay, and we're going to tweak the model with an understanding of uh, learning in mind. What if we approach all students at Queensboro and all students generally as needing, as deserving individualized academic accommodations? And what if we understand that of those students, some of them will still need to seek help from SSD, and of those students, some of them will receive additional support. But what if our premise is a little bit different? What if we flip that model a little bit and try to understand all students as deserving and requiring a little bit of academic support beyond what we usually um, provide to them in the classroom? This of course requires that we understand some of the impediments to learning that students confront as not resting in themselves, right? Not presiding in themselves, but understand that the environment in which they learn might be what is at times disabling them. Understanding that 
the curriculum and how we approach students with that curriculum might be at times what is impeding their learning. So most faculty and tutors um, consider issues of diversity and accessibility only after students with disabilities enroll in their courses or access their services. A more proactive approach is making courses and services of available and accessible to everyone, including students with disabilities from the outset. This approach is called universal design for learning. And universal design for learning, there's a definition up here, is a set of principles for curriculum development that gives all individuals equal opportunities to learn. Now the concept of universal design actually originated in architectural studies, where considerations of physical disability led to the default incorporation of assistive technologies and adaptations from the beginning of the design process, from the very beginning. What has been discovered of course is that these technologies and adaptations are actually of near universal benefit. They benefit all of us. They make built space more accessible and friendly to all users, not just users with physical disabilities. Think here about curb cuts, right, out on the street. Think also about automatic doors that many of us use every day. So informed by the work of cognitive neuroscientists, universal design for learning is grounded in the idea that because students' learning needs are diverse, our instructional strategies and also our instructional materials must also be diverse. In fact, it's this diversity that is central to the three principles of universal design for learning, which I've put up here on the screen for you. Now these principles argue that um, we should be using multiple means of representation to convey our information or course content to students, that we should allow students to express how and what they learn in multiple ways, and that we should employ different strategies to motivate and engage students in their learning. Again, it's about understanding students as diverse learners from the beginning of the educational experience. So universal design for learning stands to benefit all students. I think this is what is important for us to remember and that's what lies at the foundation of flipping that model that I showed you in the beginning. It stands to benefit all students without adaptations and retrofitting. This is built into the very design of the course from the get-go. All students can benefit as um, the various student groups up here um, that uh, we actually have research on um, attest to. I'd like to show you a video that demonstrates some of these principles and their relevance now. This teacher needs to meet a curriculum goal and she's got a very diverse group of students. And so does this teacher and this one. Most do. In fact, research shows that the way people learn is as unique as their fingerprints. What does this mean for teachers of today? Classrooms are highly diverse and curriculum needs to be designed from the start to meet this diversity. Universal design for learning is an approach to curriculum that minimizes barriers and maximizes learning for all students. Whoa, that's a fancy term. Universal design for learning. Let's unpack it a bit. Let's think about the word universal. By universal, we mean curriculum that can be used and understood by everyone. Each learner in a classroom brings her own background, strengths, needs, and interests. Curriculum should provide genuine learning opportunities for each and every student. Now let's think about the word learning. Learning is not one thing. Neuroscience tells us that our brains have three broad networks. One for recognition, the what of learning. One for skills and strategies, the how of learning. And one for caring and prioritizing, the why of learning. Students need to gain knowledge, skills, and enthusiasm for learning and a curriculum needs to help them do all three. But every learner is unique and one size does not fit all. So how do we make a curriculum that challenges and engages diverse learners? This is where the word design comes in. 
A universally designed building is planned to be flexible and to accommodate all kinds of users, with and without disabilities. It turns out that if you design for those in the margins, your building works better for everyone. Curb cuts and ramps are used by people in wheelchairs, people with strollers, and people on bikes. Captioning on TV serves people who are deaf, people learning English, people in gyms, and spouses who get to sleep at different times. UDL takes this idea and applies it to the design of flexible curriculum. UDL goes beyond access because we need to build in support and challenge. So how do we use the UDL framework to make learning goals, methods, materials, and assessments that work for everyone? First, ask yourself, what is my goal? What do I want my students to know, do, and care about? Then ask, what barriers in the classroom might interfere with my diverse students reaching these goals? To eliminate the barriers, use the three UDL principles to create flexible paths to learning so that each student can progress. Number one, provide multiple means of representation. Present content and information in multiple media and provide varied supports. Use graphics and animation, highlight the critical features, activate background knowledge, and support vocabulary so that students can acquire the knowledge being taught. Number two, provide multiple means of action and expression. Give students plenty of options for expressing what they know and provide models, feedback, and supports for their different levels of proficiency. Number three, provide multiple means of engagement. What fires up one student won't fire up another. Give students choices to fuel their interests and autonomy. Help them risk mistakes and learn from them. If they love learning, they will persist through challenges. And remember, always keep in mind the learning goal. Get rid of barriers caused by the curriculum and keep the challenge where it belongs. And that's it. Okay, quick recap. Show the information in different ways. Allow your students to approach learning tasks and demonstrate what they know in different ways. And offer options that engage students and keep their interest. Universal design for learning equals learning opportunities for all. For more information on UDL, go to www.cast.org. Okay, so I show that video for two reasons. One, because obviously I think that the content is important, but also because I think in its form it demonstrates some of what we're talking about, right? I, I mentioned a lot of what was covered in that video on my own and in the PowerPoint slides that are really text heavy, but the video now adds graphics, it adds music, it adds movement to some of what I said to you. So perhaps what I said to you made a little bit of sense, but now it makes more sense because you've seen it presented in a different format. And that's what UDL is all about. Right? Sometimes we're repeating the same content but in different ways. Sometimes we're actually teaching the new content but using different ways. And um, that's the sort of out of the gate approach that we're talking about here today. So I'm going to focus a little bit in the next couple of minutes about the um, application of universal uh, design for learning in the classroom because that's a space on campus that I know well. But again, I want to point your attention for those of you um, who are here from the learning centers to this article that I printed out, um, which is about UDL in uh, various learning centers on campus, how you can apply these principles to your interactions with students there. But a lot of what we're going to be talking about today um, in the classroom can also obviously be applied to the interaction between tutors and students too. So UDL in the classroom is um, a topic that we can look at through methods, materials, and assessment. And Johnny is going to talk to us about assessment um, in a few minutes, but I want to talk a little bit about methods and materials now. So the sort of preliminary application of UDL in the classroom involves a diversification of methods. So we want to start with student interests and abilities, for example. We want to start with where they start. That's the first thing we want to understand about our classes. As I'm thinking about designing a new course in the fall and applying these concepts to that design of the new course, I'm thinking about coming in with a very, very preliminary syllabus, for example, and allowing them to add to that syllabus in concert with me on that first day of class. I think it will require a little bit more work on my end because I'm going to have to kind of do a lot of research about the various topics they might choose, but I do think they're going to be much more engaged because they will have a 
role from the beginning in setting the curriculum design. We also want to use um, lectures, um, online and face-to-face -face discussion groups. We want to use small groups. We want to use experiential and um, uh, independent learning, perhaps like service learning, which Joe's office coordinates so well on campus. We want to diversify and repeat lecture content with PowerPoint videos and um, audio clips as I just did with you when I presented that video about UDL. We want to scaffold our content in small supported units. Many of you are familiar with scaffolding perhaps through your participation in the writing intensive workshop. But the idea of you know, feeding students little bits of information that get them learning and um, acting in incremental steps, and all those steps sort of build together towards the larger learning goal. And then using technology, which Carlos will be talking to us about um, in a few minutes with his team. We also need to think about um, applying the principles of UDL in the materials that we choose for the instruction or the interaction with students that we're engaged in. So one idea is to create an interactive multimedia course website and syllabus. And one of the reasons we want to do that is not just because we can kind of um, look fancy in our presentation of materials to students and look relevant, given that so many of them are so um, tech savvy, but when you're dealing with uh, content on the web, you can make it uh, speak back to you. You can enlarge the font, for example. Um, you can complement and present the content in various different ways. So this is actually a syllabus a UDL syllabus on UDL, okay? So there's a lot of different examples here of why a um, universally designed syllabus might be even more engaging for students. And I think you can kind of see that even as we look at this quickly together. Uh, we can create class podcast videos or transcripts. All of us as faculty members and staff have space on Blackboard that's accessible to us and we can use Blackboard as a storage space for many of that stuff. We can archive student notes. This is one idea that I find really, really interesting. The idea that we could appoint student note takers every week and students take notes in very different ways. Sometimes they take um, kind of graphic notes, image oriented notes. Sometimes they take outlines as um, some of us are maybe more familiar with. And the idea of getting notes from a number of different students so that you can show students how the act of taking notes is different, but also so you can show students um, how what one person heard in a lecture was different from from what another person heard and maybe get the whole truth through combining all of those different note sets together. Um, one thing that I think is really, really important and that I learned in the course of my research on um, universal design for learning is that we should maybe be assigning different kinds of textbooks to students. So I don't know about um, your various disciplines, but in sociology we have a number of different textbooks and a number of different textbook styles to choose from. I know that whenever I look through this kind of a textbook, and I don't mean to <laughs> to um, single out this particular publisher, but I get very, very nervous when I look at this textbook. There's so much going on, there's a lot of images, there's a lot of graphics, there's all kinds of you know, um, font design that's different for me. It makes me feel very uncomfortable to look at this textbook. So instead, I assign every semester this one, and it's all text. There's not a picture in sight, it's all text heavy. This makes me feel very, very comfortable. But when I was thinking about this, I thought to myself, well, this makes me feel very, very comfortable, but it might not make students feel very, very comfortable. It might not make all the students feel comfortable. Given that the content across these platforms is so similar, why can't I just assign both and direct students to you know, chapter one in this is chapter three in this, and you can kind of choose which format is preferable to you. I, you know, am starting to think about what makes me happy when I learn, what makes me feel comfortable when I learn, what engages me, and to recognize also that that's not the truth for everyone. Um, we can incorporate student interests and backgrounds. As I mentioned, maybe uh, we come into the classroom with a template of a syllabus in mind and we um, engage students from the very design of the course um, with, with us as educators. And we can provide study guides. I give students um, really, really detailed notes. I use PowerPoints. I um, assign them very specific pages in the book and I thought that was enough. And one day last semester, a student asked me, can you prepare a study guide? And I thought, what more could you learn 
if I prepared a study guide, but I guess, sure, I'll prepare a study guide. And they did markedly better on the exam, and they also were much happier. Didn't take that much more effort from me. I really thought it was redundant, but it was what they needed and what they wanted, and it worked. So I'm, like I mentioned, I'm learning as I go as well. Um, I'm looking forward to learning from Johnny, who's going to talk to us about assessment, which is why this is blank. So <laughs> I got out easy on that one. Um, but I want to mention to you a couple of things before I pass um, the mic to him, which is that um, there is a new surge of research being conducted on UDL in higher education, but very little of that research is coming from faculty and tutors. Very little of that writing and reflection is coming out of faculty and tutors. So this is a space for us as educators to get involved in this conversation. It's also a space for us as community college educators, I would argue, to get involved in this discussion because so much about the community college mission and the community college context kind of overlaps nicely with universal design for learning. Our emphasis on teaching, our commitment to meeting students where we are, our recognition that our students are so diverse. Um, most often we have small classes, sometimes we don't, but most often often we do. Our focus on hands-on experiential learning methods on, on um, high impacts in particular at Queensboro and the flexibility we have right now with our course in curriculum design. We have some of the space to do some of this work which I think is important. And um, just to conclude, a couple other shout outs to the other workshops that we have upcoming. The other lecture that we have, again, we have the material up here um, for you to take. You can take the schedule home with you. Um, to draw your attention also to this wonderful website that the students in SSD are helping me build, particularly Reggie, thank you, um, <laughs> helping me build where we're archiving all of these materials. We're also archiving videos from the various workshops. So if you're not able to make another one um, in the series, you can go there and find all of that archived. And then finally, as a matter of thanks again, I just want to acknowledge the various offices on Queensboro's campus that are helping us pull this together and also give credit where credit is due, which is to CUNY who's, who supported us and supported this conversation with the Diversity um, Projects Development Fund grant. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Johnny Nelson who has a mic already, I understand, yes. very good. Okay, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about assessment and universal design for learning. All right, we've already established that we have a diversity of learners, different people that are from different backgrounds, from different places, different experiences, different uh, um, uh, perspective where they come from. And they all come to the classroom uh, and we have to teach them. Uh, we talked about the necessity to create a system that can reach out to all of them different means of giving that information to the students. Now we want to also talk about a uh, different way of measuring whether or not they have that information. Uh, if we have different ways of giving it, we, admit, we, we accept the fact that the students are different, why is it that we have to use the same way of doing things? That's why I am one of those people who cannot understand why they have to have everything standardized. Because standard, standardized does not necessarily mean it's showing all the real knowledge. I usually think when somebody says they know some things, it's when they can tell it to me in their own words, their own way. That's measuring learning 100% as, as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't have to do with grades. It's all about learning. And that when it's about learning, it removes the whole stress idea that I have to have a grade, I have to have an A, I have to have a B. Oh my gosh, I cannot fail. And all of that creates some anxiety that are unnecessary, and those anxieties tend to cause the students to not do as well as they could uh, 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 in a testing situation, in showing exactly whether they learned something or not. And so uh, we have to look at different ways of giving the students uh, a way of showing what they have learned. In doing so, I thought of uh, putting it like, uh, we said universal design for learning, we go all the way in the universal course design. In designing the course, we think of all people that are going to be that possibly can take the class. It's not for any reason that you will not see that they don't make those door handles anymore. They don't make them at all. Uh, why? Because they're not convenient. If you're getting older, you're having arthritis, you cannot turn that door. 
or if your hand is a little bit wet, it's raining, forget about it. You will see they make those levers over there instead. That's universal design that decided to change that because it gives everybody else a chance to um, be able to use that door and enter automatically. You will see the door, automatic door, hand, door, door openers. It's nice to have them and everybody loves them. But they were designed for people mostly on wheelchairs who could not pull a door open and, and so forth or crutches. But the most people want to use it. Why? Because if you're carrying two bags in your hands, I don't care what you do, you will be praying, thank God for this door that can open by itself. Because uh, uh, it's designed in such a way that everybody can use it. If you're pushing grocery carts in New York City and there were no curb cuts, you would have a hard time pushing it, that little, you know, fighting with it to go through. They didn't design it primarily for those purposes, but most people are using it for that. It's the same way for universal design when it comes to classroom and, and instruction for that matter. Uh, when something is designed with everybody in mind, it, is, it becomes a lot easier for the whole population that, of users. And that's all that is behind the whole principle, that it makes things easier for everyone, everyone. Uh, it was not really, the primary purpose was not for people with disabilities. Universal design has very little with disability, to do with disabilities. It has to do with people in general. And, um, and when people start thinking, oh well, people with disabilities, I always say, well, if we live long enough, we will have one or two of them. We just have to live long, and that's all. And this is one of the purposes of life. We have to get there somehow. And so we have to empathize and understand the fact that we will be there and evaluation will come at some point uh, to one of us. In some ways, we have to show that we can do certain things proficiently. Now, uh, when it comes to showing a student showing what they have learned in a classroom, teachers have to be creative. It's very difficult uh, for teachers who have been teaching for a long time, who have developed a style, who have developed a certain pattern and then they have their own niche of way, this is my way and this is the way I do things. And it's very hard for a student of this generation who have learned that there are many different ways you can get to that area there. It doesn't mean you have to go there that way. But well, you could go all around like that. For them, they feel going around is the best way. You could say, well, this is the shortest way. They say, well, for me, this is the shortest way because I like to go around. I don't like to go straight up. It doesn't mean you're going to get lost. The idea of what the student needs to be able to do is to show, can you get there without getting lost? And that's the task. It's not can you get there, how can you get there faster, really, but can you get there without being lost? And that's the thing that the student understands when he says, can you go get there? It's not how fast you can get there, but can you get there without being lost? And in designing a course, the teacher must be asking himself, what is it I want these students to learn in the class after this class is over? What are the main ingredients of the class and what are the main objectives of the class that I want them to have? And once you decide those, you design your rubrics, you say, well, what are the ways then I can ask them to show me those things? In the past, I'm using that very loosely, in the past, uh, people used to have one method. Okay, I have multiple choice, I have a schedule sheet, and that's it. And that's the way everybody has to go by it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the person knows all of that. For some students, this is the hardest way to show that they know something because they cannot show their knowledge through that means. They will not have the best, they cannot show their, their, their knowledge. They cannot show that they have learned something. They just cannot. So a teacher has to say, well, instead of providing that as an option, what are other means that I can use to have these students or those students show me what they have learned? And then you use those means. What I tell teachers all the time is to have those things done at the beginning of the semester. You set all these rules from the syllabi, from the syllabus. And they decide, the students decide for themselves, these are the ways that I want to be uh, evaluated in the end. I always ask teachers also to put a statement of disability in their syllabus, just a statement, just to say if you have a disability, let me know or you need to contact the office so that they can let me know how I be can best help you. Or if you have an objection to one of the things that I'm going to be the objective of the class or you are having difficulties doing them, contact me. 
So this way, there is a door opening for dialogue between the student and the teacher this way. You will get to know the student, and you will get to know how to help these students better understand whatever you want to teach that student. And it's something that is totally necessary when you want the students to really show you what they have learned. All people, that are, all people can learn. This is one principle that we have to agree on. Everybody can learn. It's just that everybody cannot learn at the same rate, at the same pace, and the same way. And also, people cannot show that they have learned things the same way. Unfortunately, we have a universal way, as it is right now, for everyone to do that. It's either the class at the end do a term paper, and everybody has to do a term paper, or everybody has to go through uh, 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 a long essay exams, or everybody has to go one size fits all when it comes to the final exam. Okay, everybody's going to do the same thing. Well, the universal design principle says you can choose different ways. For instance, for some students, you design from the very beginning. Well, uh, those of you, how many of you would like multiple choice? Okay, they choose multiple choice. You design an exam for people who will be multiple choice. You design an exam for people who will want short essays. There are students who rather do a take home exam. These are the hardest ones. That's what they want to give. You give them a take home exam. If they want to, because the whole idea is for them to show that they have mastered the concepts that you gave them. So any means that you can give them as an option for them to do that, they will be able to do it. And then in the end, everybody will pass. One of the ways, one of the things that we tried at LaGuardia um, is, was amazing. By, by, by just sheer coincidence, we discovered something. Uh, those of you who teach math, there used to be a, a couple of years back, a math uh, exam, not the compass that we have now. There was a math, CUNY math, that students couldn't pass. And no matter how hard there were students who just could not pass it. The stress, of, because they didn't pass it one time, that stress compounded in a way that they always have this mental block they cannot pass. And one day, we, uh, the teacher, we were talking about it, discussing, so what if uh, uh, you give it as a practice exam? Because they find out that those students who could not pass, they took the practice test and passed all the time. So why is it they can just, so the teachers decided, we're not going to tell them that they're taking the final exam. We're just going to give it as a practice. No pressure, no incentive not to pass. Nobody worries about passing or failing. They're just going to take the practice test, and then that's it, because they know it's a practice. So there is no, no nothing at stake. Everybody passed. Everybody passed. And that's when they realize, you know, there is something about, once you mentioned, there is a test that caused people to start, oh my gosh, what if I fail? Because they, for, they forget what the whole thing is all about. It's about learning, showing what you have learned. Once a teacher designed it in terms of the person has to show what they have learned, you could decide, well, you're going to have an oral examination. Well, you come and I ask you questions and you answer me in your own words. And you answer my questions, if you can do that, that's what you choose, okay, let's go with that. Somebody, you could give them, okay, you design a website. You like to work in computers and do that, you design a website, the web content, everything is on you. And then I will evaluate that at the end of the class. Some people will come with, you give them to demonstrate two or three concepts by whatever they can do. If they're an artist, well, they do that as part of an art project, and they do that as to describe whatever they learned in the class, in the concept that you wanted to have. You can give them many, many different ways. Well, you could also give multiple choice. And you can also give short essays and all of that. There will be people who will want those instead. The idea is you give every student a way of showing what they have learned. It requires the teacher to be a little bit more creative, a little bit more flexible. But in the end, isn't it better that it pays off because um, everybody pass. Your class passing rate is a lot greater. And you will feel a lot better that everybody understood everything about your class. And believe it or not, more students will want to choose your class because they will feel it's easier. It's not because it's easier. It's because the information is presented in such a way that they have the mindset that it's a lot easier because I can get it, because I have different ways of getting to it. In the past, those of you who went to school, when I went to school, to do a research project, it was a big deal. You had to go to the library to do the whole thing. 
And if you had some time, you know, write your notes by hand, because there was no computer or laptops or nothing like that. So you have to do all your writing by hand and make sure and you take that home and then do some more writing by hand and all of that, and then pay somebody to type it if you didn't have a typewriter yourself. See, I, I went through that. <laughs> well, nowadays, we search, it, somebody can Google something and they have the whole information in front of them. So research is not about trying to find the information anymore because finding information is not a big deal. It's managing the um, vast amount of information that comes now to use it and how can you use it the best. And that's how we need to teach to think about universal design and getting students to show us what they have learned. How can you get this all vast amount of knowledge and show it to me just like that, that you know it? And that's the whole point of assessment of learning in universal design. Give students choices, many different choices, be a little, be a little bit flexible with them so that they can uh, uh, feel that they own the way that they're showing you what they learn. And in the end, you yourself will feel that you had a great class, that everybody will be there. I encourage you to try this, just try. Because I like people to try things and to see if it works for you. And I can tell you, once you try it, you will see the faces of the students. You will be hooked by looking at the students, how they like it. You will be hooked doing it, and then you will develop a new style of teaching. And probably, who knows? People do research all the time for things. You probably will be one of those people presenting your own classroom research, your own classroom experience at other faculty presentations. And then they probably will do it, and then the whole campus, one day, will be universally designed for learning and students will be universally uh, 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 accepted in everywhere and everybody will feel that they are part of the whole community really because things are thought of with them in mind. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Rosa. Uh, it's really my honor and privilege to be here. Um, uh, it's a little humbling to uh, follow such remarkable speakers. And I thought Amy and Johnny did a remarkable job in uh, laying a theoretical foundation for the concept of universal design and some really thoughtful ways in which it has an impact of, of learning in all aspects, quite frankly, of, of life here at, at colleges like Queensboro and beyond. Um, I'm not an expert in universal design, and um, I'm, I have nowhere near the expertise in technology access that uh, Carlos Herrera and his colleagues at the CUNY Assistive Technology Services Project, based here at Queensboro, have. And so uh, I feel as though my challenge will be just to help to provide you context, maybe to bridge uh, the, the key principles and the foundations that you heard from Amy and Johnny and provide a frame of reference for uh, the very uh, leading edge information that you're going to get from Carlos and his colleagues. And I don't, uh, I don't understate that in any way. Um, the CUNY Assistive Technology Services Project is uh, a nationally regarded best practice in providing uh, technological access based on the principles of universal design. And Carlos, Ben, and his team uh, are really uh, national figures in providing technical, technological access to students with disabilities uh, in post-secondary education. So humbling though it may be, I'm going to do my best to provide you a frame of reference. And because I, I only had a limited amount of time, I wanted to use as my frame of reference um, web accessibility and core principles of universal design as they're embedded in web accessibility. And all of us know who, who live and work and learn in higher education that web accessibility is now an integral and independ indispensable part of all aspects of college and university life, certainly related to instruction and information management. But it has to do with the very elemental ways we, we manage all aspects of a campus life. Um, and it's in that context that I'd like to talk with you a little bit about the principles of universal design and provide you with a context for Carlos's presentation. Um, we didn't compare notes, so I apologize if I step all over your present. You'll forgive me, I trust. Okay, so um, 
the frame of reference when it comes to universal design for individuals with disabilities in, in the higher education context, of course, is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And all of us know, um, who, who are interested in, the, in access and opportunity, uh, that the ADA is, without a doubt, one of the most far-reaching pieces of civil rights legislation ever enacted. Um, and it's clearly a, a critical piece of, of legislation, not only because of its significance as a political uh, document, uh, something that was generated through uh, widespread uh, bipartisan support in Congress, which is unheard of these days, um, signed into law by, by a, a, a fairly conservative political figure, uh, George Bush, President George Herbert Walker Bush, um, yet everybody could agree upon these core principles of equal access and opportunity for all Americans, including individuals with disabilities. It's also a, a, an important legal document, and my friend and colleague Mavis Hall is responsible for ADA compliance here at Queensborough, and that's really the lens through which she views um, how the college is, is conducting all of its business to make sure that in the way it does so, that it's inclusive and, and, it, and it features the principles of universal design for individuals with disabilities. But it's also, from my perspective, an important cultural document. Um, it embodies our, our consensus as a nation of how we ought to think about individuals with disabilities, what their role is in our communities, including our campus communities. And um, that moral consensus in many, respect, in many respects here is reflected in the core elements of the principles of universal design. Um, and understanding this, uh, I think, understanding this aspect is key to understanding how people with disabilities contribute uniquely and significantly to the very rich diversity that you enjoy here at Queensborough Community College and indeed that we enjoy throughout CUNY. Thank you. So what does the ADA tell us about disability culture and what we believe as a community and, and as a culture, contemporary American culture, about individuals with disabilities? Well, the act itself is called the Americans with Disabilities Act, not the Disabled Americans Act, not the Handicapped Americans Act, not the Individuals with Special Needs Act. It reflects a consensus that um, 57 million Americans are now uh, slowly but surely arriving at in terms of how they think of themselves and how, like, they, how they like to describe themselves and their experiences. And the, the Americans with Disabilities Act says a lot, I think, about the, the, uh, the core values that Americans with disabilities espouse, that first and foremost, they see themselves as Americans who want the same things, who have the same goals, the same values, the same dreams as all other Americans. Um, but they're also fiercely pride of their identity as individuals with disabilities, as part of a, a transformative community of 57 million Americans who are quite literally remaking the face of American society in their own image. Um, so I think there's what's in a name, I think that tells you an awful lot about what people with disabilities in the United States believe about themselves. Um, the ADA kind of gives us some structure through its three-pronged definition of who, who do we include when we talk about Americans with disabilities? Who's covered? And by extension, who do we consider part of the, Ameri of the American disability community? And um, the three-pronged definition uh, of the ADA says that you're, an individual, you're protected by the ADA if you're an individual with a disability, if you have a history of a disability, or if you're regarded as an individual with a disability. And so in many respects, um, uh, Amy and I are social scientists, but the ADA's uh, three-pronged definition is a social constructivist definition of who's covered uh, by this law. And it's fluid enough to uh, shift with the changing notions and, and the changing populations that emerge who claim access, opportunity, and full citizenship through this act. And so when the ADA was first signed into law in 1990, um, there was no reference to people with HIV and AIDS, and yet they're, they're a very important and significant constituency that, who really rely on the ADA for their civil rights protection. There was very little reference uh, to individuals on the autism spectrum when the ADA was first drafted in 1990, but yet the fluidity of this definition is enough to allow this emerging group uh, to have their rights uh, opportunities and experiences protected, reflected, and articulated
through this act. Um, finally, the, the ADA uh, reflects the fact that it's a, a community of memory. Um, in, the, in the creation of the ADA, um, before we even got to the drafting of law, Congress held uh, several weeks of hearings on Capitol Hill where individuals with disabilities and their advocates had their opportunities to tell their stories about uh, their, their and what emerged were trends, common themes, uh, common experiences with discrimination and exclusion, uh, common feelings of empowerment over having the principles of universal design implemented to create access and opportunity when once there was none. And through those shared stories, those shared accounts, people with disabilities, uh, I think, realize that they're part of a community, uh, certainly a larger community of 57 million Americans, not just atomized individuals with individual disabilities, but people who had common experiences with discrimination, and exclusion, um, et cetera. And that common history, in, in many respects, is what binds Americans with disabilities as a community. And finally, um, the ADA as an act uh, was designed to level the playing field through the notion of reasonable accommodation, which, uh, through which um, barriers are, are removed in order to make sure that individuals are evaluated on their merit alone and, and not through any impact that's rendered through the impact of barriers. And that's why the principles of universal design are so crucially important because in all aspects of American life, it allows Americans with disabilities to be evaluated like all other Americans and given the opportunity to succeed or fail on their merit and their merit alone. Okay. okay. Um, so I gave you a sense of the community and memory. I got a little bit ahead of myself. Okay, so, that, uh, so I'll get to the, my third bullet, which, or second and third, which again, the ADA was enacted uh, in a particular historical and cultural context and it's expressed over the last 20 or so years um, in different cultural and historical contexts. And what the ADA has meant um, now varies greatly over that, over that arc of history because of the changes in our culture, the, change or who have, the changes in who has claimed, claimed the act. And, um, and so when we talk, could I have the next slide, Mavis? So when we talk about leveling the playing field, Clearly, in the last 20 years in higher education, what, what is regarded as the playing field, where we learn, how we learn, that has changed significantly in the two decades since the ADA has been acted. Um, generally speaking, the key principles of the ADA have not changed since its enactment, but really what has changed is the playing field itself, the, the higher ed context, and the digital revolution has really had a transformative effect on all of us but particularly the challenges and the opportunities for meaningful universal design and meaningful access for people with disabilities. So what, are, what is the playing field in the higher ed context, particularly as it relates to, to individuals with disabilities? Certainly the classroom, um, the workplace, uh, student services, student affairs, library, where we still get a, a lot of our important information, um, textbooks and instructional materials, um, the campus itself, and the larger notion of the college and the university. This is the playing, these are the elements of the playing field. Um, and the web has really transformed the playing field as we understand it. The web is now central to the higher education enterprise. Um, we recruit, search, hire, and manage faculty and staff via the web now. We manage student records via the web. You guys were a Vanguard campus. I don't have to tell you about that. All the pain of CUNY First, you understand firsthand what that means. Um, we, might, we manage financial aid data via the web. Um, we handle all aspects of enrollment management via the web, including recruitment, admissions, financial aid, registration, student record management, and communication with students. Um, our curricula are increasingly rooted in web-based modalities, including our syllabi, assignments, instructional materials, reading assignments, and research library resources. Um, distance learning is anchored via the web, and um, it, it's growing exponentially. And on the horizon, we hear about MOOCs, massive open online courses, um, and if that changes the paradigm of higher education in the way we predict, then it will be a higher stakes setting for universal design 
um, and for the playing field than ever before. Leadership, service learning, co-curricular life increasingly rely on the web, especially for social media, through which our students communicate with each other. So um, new approaches have to be employed for, uh, for a new playing field. And the web provides us really with an unprecedented opportunity to fully include and engage individuals with disabilities in all aspects of university life. But as a cautionary tale, um, it also presents us with unprecedented risk of leaving people with disabilities behind uh, when websites are designed in ways that are not meaningfully accessible. This is the digital divide, and early on when Al Gore invented the web, um, used, we, we talked about the digital divide and we talked about socioeconomic factors where some people would have access to purchase technology and others wouldn't. I, I think generally, um, just because of the, the proliferation of, tech, of technology in general, the prices come way down in, in the last two decades. It's still pricey, but more people have access to more technology smartphone uh, and, and readily, readily, how, readily accessibility, how readily accessible and comparatively affordable they are has really kind of leveled the digital divide when it comes to putting uh, technology in the hands of all Americans. But now, because of the, the potential for barriers embedded in the way we design web-based modalities, people with disabilities are at, are at greater risk of being left on the other side of that crevasse of the digital divide than ever before. And so we're, we're confronted with this unprecedented challenge and I would argue a sacred responsibility to make sure that web-based resources are accessible uh, to people with disabilities. Um, as you know, uh, the ADA, Title II of the ADA governs our obligations when it comes to uh, equal access and opportunity for people with disabilities in the higher ed context. And the program accessibility requirements under Title II of the ADA extend to technology and to the web in particular. Um, it requires all of our electronic and digital programs to be accessible to people with disabilities. So course management systems like Blackboard, for example, um, have to be accessible to individuals with disabilities. And for those of you who use Blackboard, you know it's a challenge in general. Um, and for my colleagues in CATS, um, they've encountered challenges in making sure that Blackboard and all its modalities are fully accessible to students with disabilities. Course websites um, have to be designed in ways that are accessible to people with disabilities. And we know that at Queensboro, we have a pretty, uh, a pretty rigorous standard to make sure that whatever goes up on your page um, is accessible to people with disabilities. Faculty don't necessarily have the same training or the same awareness, and so when they put up their own homegrown pages. Um, it's so easy to put up a web page these days. Um, it's also important to be vigilant in terms of web accessibility and, and to provide them with, with that kind of expertise to make sure that what they're putting out there for their classes are accessible. Um, library search engines and digital archives, um, uh, digital versions of articles in particular, uh, are important to ensure that that's accessible. So when something's put on electronic reserve, um, it's important to make sure that those electronic files are in, form, are in forms that can be readily accessible to, to all students with disabilities. So it should be um, you know, in a rich text format or um, a, a PDF version that can be read by a screen reader, not just your garden variety PDF, which might not be accessible to a lot of uh, assistive technologies. Um, distance learning programs, which are web-based, um, certainly uh, web accessibility is crucial. And um, as I mentioned, university websites, when we think about what the front gate is of our, of our campus, um, it's no longer the one that I just passed out on 56th out there. Right now, it's our portal. It's our, our websites that are now the, the front gate to our campuses. And you know, how those are designed says a lot about how we manage our campuses. And that becomes the, the, the front line for access for all individuals, but particularly people with disabilities. Um, so when, implement, when the implementing uh, regulations for the ADA were first promulgated, um, it was 1992-93. Um, the, the internet was in its infancy, and so the ADA and the Department of Justice was silent 
to web access because again, the web was at its in infancy. It was just morely, merely conceptual. Um, the Access Board of the Department of Justice has signaled that they will be issuing standards on web accessibility and access to, to technology. But recent uh, court cases give us a glimpse of where the new the ADA regs are likely to be headed. Um, one important example is the Princeton University Kindle case um, where the, the, uh, the court ruled that, um, it's rec that Princeton, in use of Kindle, uh, had to give substantially equivalent ease of use. So right now, we're, we're all concerned at CUNY, and we're very invested in making electronic textbooks available to our students to control costs, most of all, and to make sure that it's affordable to our students. In doing so, we have to make sure that we're providing it in a modality that's accessible to all students, including students with disabilities. And when Ivy League schools who are bumping up against this, it serves as sort of a bellwether for things to come. Um, it, it, the, the OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, in a Dear Colleagues letter, directed college presidents to ensure that technology is equally effective and equally integrated into, into campus communities. So th those are sort of the core principles. And we have to think on all of our campuses about what's that, what that means in all its iterations. And finally, um, Target, Target, for those of you who, are, who like it as much as I do, um, we're at the forefront of the, the web accessibility battle when um, the Department of Justice ruled that, um, that the web, the, the, the World Wide Web, and a presence on a web is a place of public accommodation. So a place like Target is equally required to make all aspects of its website as accessible as it is all aspects of their retail stores. They have the same kind of responsibilities as their brick and mortar responsibilities. Okay. So um, our implications for our approach to compliance and diversity these days, with capital funds increasingly scarce, there are typically many more websites under construction than brick and mortar facilities. Um, from compliance and risk management perspectives, higher ed institutions need to consider investing comparable resources in web access and, and as in facilities access. Here at Queensboro, you're, you're very fortunate to have really national leaders in this, but as a university, as CUNY, we really need to think about investing the same, having the same level of commitment um, from IT and beyond in making sure that, we're, that all aspects of our, of our web presence are equally accessible to individuals with disabilities. And it's as important to have a web accessibility coordinator on our campuses as it is to have a facilities director who's knowledgeable about the Americans with Disabilities Act architectural guidelines. Just like we scrutinize when new buildings go up or renovations are made that it's compliant with code, we're gonna need the same vigilance and rigor when it comes to somebody monitoring to make sure that the, that the web resources that we're putting up are equally accessible. Um, and it's important to begin the development of a web accessibility policy. And I know our colleagues at CATS have begun those conversations. Cornell University, I don't have the link there, but it's, it's really a, a best practice, I think, in, in web accessibility policy. It gives really great guidance and resources to faculty um, and to all members of the university community when it comes to developing accessible websites. And regarding diversity, I think web accessibility makes a crucial statement. As I mentioned earlier, um, the first place that a, a student, a prospective student will visit um, will largely not be your admissions office, it'll largely be your web page. And whether or not it's accessible um, sends a very powerful message to a student with a disability. If a student with a disability for whom web access is a consideration visits a web page and finds that it's accessible, it sends a very powerful message. It says that this institution is run with my, my interest in mind, that I'm truly welcome here. And this, this institution is concerned in a very meaningful way in embracing me as part of this campus community. And that's what we're all about here in this lecture series. And so it's in that spirit that I hand it off to somebody who's really great in inclusive design, Carlos Herrera. Right. OK, well, um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to uh, Amy Traver for um, putting this together and bringing together a fabulous panel, uh, minus me. I mean, I'm. I'm I'm the low man on the totem pole in terms of talent 
and or knowledge. And so uh, thanks to Johnny uh, Nelson from LaGuardia and to uh, Dean Rosa uh, for coming today and, and especially for Dean Rosa's uh, kind words. Um, we, we hope to uh, live up to, them, to, to your expectations. In any case, my name is Carlos Herrera. I'm the Assistant Director of Disability Services here at Queensboro, and I also uh, manage the CATS uh, project, which I'll talk about in a moment, along with Ben Fryer, who's the Director of uh, Disability Services. Um, and um, joining us are some of the CATS team members in the back, and they'll be doing a hands-on demonstration of some products and assistive technologies once we get done with the uh, presentations. So please don't head out, uh, stick around to take a, a, a first-hand look at some of the tools that are actually in use here on campus. Um, Siobhan Mahabir, Chris Tarcher, Reggie Coupe, who's our CATS resident webmaster and a QCC graduate. Um, and am I missing anyone? Um, no, I, that, that's most of the crowd. We have some other part-time folks who also help deliver assistive technology to the students here on campus. So, um, quick word about CATS, and um, where's my CATS slide? Oh, I moved it. CATS is CUNY Assistive Technology Services, and so instead of saying all that every time we want to refer to it, we call it the CATS Project. I'll be um, sprinkling my comments with references to CATS, and um, CATS is a university-wide project that has been funded by a council made up of the directors of the various disability services offices and with strong support from Dean Rose's office um, provides technology and support of that technology and indirectly support to the students uh, with disabilities that attend the university and to all the staff that work with them. Um, today I want to try to cover a, a lot of information and um, present it in an understandable and relevant fashion. It's not going to be a geek fest. We're not going to get wrapped up on the coolness factor of whatever particular, uh, whatever technology we may mention. But instead, I wanted to make the comments and information I present relevant to you who as faculty may be working with students with disabilities, may know someone who could benefit from the, the technology. So there'll be some overlap and information both touching upon universal design in learning and the technology and the developments in, in practices of the use of that technology. We'll talk about what we mean by assistive technology and I want to mention that I'm happy that many of you brought along your own assistive technology because it is a tool that enables us to do things that might otherwise be possible, impossible for us to do. Um, we'll talk about how AT, which is again shorthand for assistive technology, uh, is used by students uh, here on campus, why they need to use it and why they benefit from using it, and how all of us can help to increase access or accessibility to higher education, our classes, our course offerings. Uh, I'll go through some resources that you uh, would benefit from uh, utilizing and handouts which we won't be handing out but which will be posted on CATS web but I'll talk about the kind of stuff that's available on CATS web which is the CUNY Assistive Technology Services website. Um, something that again is supported by the university and is a great online resource for you to visit. So again, here's my CATS web slide. It's out of order, but we've talked a little bit about it. Um, again, funded by Student Disability Ser uh, Services Directors Council, and we support assistive technology teams across the university. So any campus that provides services to students with disabilities, and that's every campus because they are mandated to do so, would in most cases provide assistive technology, and the CATS project supports them. Um, assistive technology, any technology that's used by a person with a disability in order to perform a function that might otherwise be difficult or impossible. 
And um, again, there's bleed over into the general community just as universal design concepts bleed over, um, or in fact, uh, uh, come from the, the, the general population, the general community. Uh, assistive technology can help an individual with or without a disability. It can include walkers, wheelchairs, other hardware, software, and peripherals that assist people with disabilities um, in accessing computers and information. And again, to follow up on, on Chris's point with the transition to uh, the electronic and digital uh, space that we find ourselves in, assistive technology has immense implications and immense value in providing that access. Um, people with hand function may use keyboards that have large keys or keys uh, that don't respond as rapidly as a standard computer keyboard because of mobility um, limitations. Blind students would use software that would read the screen and other objects, text and other objects that they need to access. Um, and we've seen TTYs, which are telephones for folks who are deaf and folks who um, have other sorts of impairments use a variety of hardware. We'll touch on some of that. I'll show you some videos and some um, quick examples of how that's being used across higher ed. Here's just a couple of samples of some keyboards. You may have, not, may, may have seen these in the past, but again, these are useful for folks who have mobility impairments. They can access a computer, they can manipulate a computer, create and edit documents using a, a keyboard that connects to any PC. Um, screen magnification software is any software that would enlarge a standard image on a computer. So you have a student who needs to access the web for whatever purpose. They can use a standard PC outfitted with screen magnification software to allow that image on the screen to be enlarged. Now that image doesn't change in its original design or content. It simply is enlarged and you can move the screen around um, anywhere from two to 36 times depending on the product. So these, these images reflect how a person would be able to see the exact same content um, that's on the web page without manipulating or changing the content on the page just in an uh, enlarged fashion. Now all of this is driven by the law. Uh, any institution that receives federal funding must um, provide access to persons um, with disabilities and this is the, the, the um, foundation for uh, the, these laws that emanate, Chris mentioned the ADA, um, and under these laws the use of assistive technology is what's considered a reasonable accommodation and that is what we try to do through the services at um, the Office of Students with Disabilities, that is provide reasonable accommodations to students so that they may access the materials and the offerings offered in our institutions of learning. Um, it doesn't simply mean uh, electronic door openers. It means tools that allow you to access information. And again, since the information is now um, more and more only available electronically or, or becoming uh, electronic, we have to find tools and software products that allow a student with a disability to access that as well. Now, uh, types of reasonable accommodations that make sense for different students might be um, captioning of videos. This is a big one, I think, for a lot of faculty who use videos in their courses. Much of the stuff uh, is either not captioned um, or is self-produced or we pull it out of uh, YouTube, and while YouTube does have some tools that create captions, it's not ready for prime time yet. But this is a problem for any student who uh, can't hear the, le the, the, the audio portion of your video. So video captioning is an, a reasonable accommodation that utilizes assistive technology and or other types of technologies. We'll talk about that particular one a little later when I show you a video. But um, students who are learning dis disabled would also benefit from an audio recording, which can be um, provided 
by using a standard tape recorder, right? So when we talk about assistive technology, it ranges in complexity and cost, uh, some very common items to some really esoteric and unique kind of products. Print disabled students, students who um, are low vision or blind can benefit from uh, alternate formats or electronic formats of the same materials that you print and hand out. So these are ways that we utilize assistive technology uh, and technology, information technology, to provide access to students with disabilities as a reasonable accommodation. So what's the benefit? Why would a student use it? Um, well, again, students with learning disabilities, it mitigates some of the impact of their learning disability uh, to provide information in a form that's accessible as well as accessible to the assistive technology tools that we may use. Uh, we'll talk quickly in a little while about something called Kurzweil 3000, which is a product that students with learning disabilities and other disabilities can use to help them improve their reading comprehension, their, reading, uh, their writing skills. Uh, also, some of the tools built into that product allow for students with attention deficits to focus on information and improve their processing. Um, and as we go down the list, students with hearing loss, or again, the print and electronic material, uh, manipulating uh, space uh, and devices or navigating barriers. Um, and at the end, improve, help improve students' self-confidence. For many students with disabilities, that's a bigger payoff than anything else. Um, and that's been my experience in working with uh, students who for many years, perhaps, and this is again is a generalization, but for many years are told that, hmm, you know, maybe you can't, maybe you can, but there's always a seed of doubt being planted. Maybe their experience has been that because of the barriers that they've confronted, that they start to believe that they can't do certain things. Assistive technology has, and I can point to students who have graduated from Queensboro who have told me how this has affected their own self-perceptions and confidence, it will, in many cases, help improve a student's self-confidence and success rate. So, we don't just hand out AT like uh, Girl Scout cookies. Uh, we try to do an assessment when we meet a student where, that we believe uh, would benefit. We do an assessment when we believe there's a student that can benefit from assistive technology. Um, we have assistive technology specialists who spend a lot of time learning the software, working with students, and um, we try to match the appropriate tool to the students that uh, we believe would benefit from it. Some students come here sponsored by or with experience with rehabilitation agencies, most commonly the Commission for the Blind and Visually Handicapped, or um, what used to be known as VESID and is now known as ACCESS-VR. I forget what the acronym stands for, but trust me, they, they, they work with many of our students. And they sometimes provide uh, technology training. If additional training is required, the followers in the CATS team and, and in the SSD office can provide additional training. Some of the products that we use are Kurzweil 3000, uh, and Read and Write Gold, which are reading and writing, uh, what they call them reading and writing learning suites. And they assist students with uh, reading comprehension and writing skills, um, memory mapping, organizational skills, and uh, other related study skills. And they have a very complex set of tools. All of them can be customized and um, to the student's specific needs and abilities. Because again, when you do an assessment, you find that not every student is as adept at using a computer. Some of these tools require that a student be able to manipulate a keyboard readily. Um, and so depending on the, the student's ability, as determined by the assessment, we'll, we'll apply the, the correct uh, remedy. Dragon Naturally Speaking is a product that many of you may be familiar with. They do a lot of advertising on TV. They basically voice recognition software that allows you to dictate to the computer and have your dictation typed in Microsoft Word or other word processing. It also allows you to control uh, the computer, to navigate through folders, to start programs, close programs, edit, 
Um, and it's gotten really, really good at doing that. So this product has made tremendous uh, strides from its first inceptions where you would install it and about six hours later burn your computer down because it was just horrendous. But now you, out of the box it's about 90% uh, efficient. Visually impaired students on campus will use either Zoom text, which is a magnifier and reader, which enlarges your image. You saw that a little earlier. Uh, they might use a large print keyboard so they can see the keys and, um, or use JAWS, which is what's called a screen reader. And basically JAWS does exactly that. It reads the objects on the screen. It would read that PowerPoint slide. I could press the start menu key on my keyboard and it would report to me start menu key so that I could as a blind person or low vision person use a computer, use all of the mainstream uh, programs, surf the web, actually navigate Blackboard, um, not without some difficulty and the caveat which I always uh, keep in mind and tell folks is that the tool is powerful but it's not always the tools, it's the plumber, you know? So if you don't know how to use your assistive technology, you could have a, a wonderful tool, but still not have access. So it's a combination, and that's where some of our training ability and um, the tools combination work out. And again, mobility impaired, this is a broad category, but we use Dragon trackballs, which are alternative uh, mice and or computer control devices. There are even apps for students uh, on the autism spectrum, uh, the, uh, the spectrum, and um, these are in response to the growing uh, usage of smartphones and portable devices. And we just picked this up uh, the other day. We had a uh, CATS event with Apple Computer because we're trying to incorporate more Apple or iOS products in the product mix of uh, solutions for students with disabilities and they forwarded this information to us. But this contains a lot of different tools for students uh, with autism or, or Asperger's. And you know, you, you have to look at it a little bit more closely. This is all going to be available on CATS web, so don't strain. Um, you, you'll be able to download this information and, and read it. Um, but there are even apps for assistive technology. So the industry is trying to keep pace uh, with the development in the hardware side of the house because most of these tools obviously are software. All right, this is an image of the um, QCC, uh, Services for Students with Disabilities Lab um, and, and Tutoring Center. We have uh, 10 computers including a Mac on this side of the room, but this was um, taken the other day. We removed all the students for privacy reasons. Um, and um, it's generally full. We also conduct testing on, on, on a side room and we have a tutoring section on the other side for students in remedial courses. Um, and all of these computers have assistive technologies on them, more than the ones that I'm going to talk to you about, but they also have all of the um, Microsoft programs, uh, Word, PowerPoint, that students may use in their coursework. Every lab on campus has an ADA compliant workstation which is uh, um, maintained by SSD and that contains uh, a few of the assistive technology products. You see the icons up there in the upper left hand corner. Um, we've recently uh, started outfitting all of the workstations with um, labeling which goes beyond just um, telling you that this is a uh, workstation reserved for a student with disabilities, but in a flash of insight provided by Amy Traver, decided to give you instructions on how to actually run a program should you need to do that. Uh, because we assume that maybe you knew that you could double click on the icon, but then maybe you don't. So uh, you will be seeing these labels across the campus on all of the ADA compliant workstations. So if you have a student who can't, for whatever reason, uh, locate or access this, uh, the assistive technology on the computer, it gives you a quick uh, cheat sheet, so to speak. Okay, so 
We at CATS also make recommendations across the university uh, on minimum specifications for computers to be used in labs and classrooms by students with disabilities. Again, this chart is going to be available on CATS web, so you'll be able to take a closer look at it, but it refers to um, equipment including um, describing what students would benefit from this type of equipment and or software. Uh, it would tell you who provides it, uh, and if you don't get the information you need here, it gives you a link to connect directly to CATS and, uh, and the AT fellows who are going to uh, provide support. I want to show a couple of quick videos. Uh, the first one is something produced at uh, another college, um, and we're in the midst of, at Catchway. We do have some videos on our website, but I found this one to be particularly uh, useful. And it's a short five minute or so video. ZoomText is a screen magnification software. It allows you to zoom in progressively larger, up to times 26. It's for students with low vision, and it, we all, it also allows you to do things like change the background color. So you can do yellow on black, do something like a black on white, or you can go to an invert the blacks and the whites to give a gray scale background. You also change the pointer to make it easier to follow along with. So I'm going to change it to yellow with a red cross. You can follow along underneath. Or you could do giant green. Makes it easier to follow along for students with low vision. And I'll show how it works with Internet Explorer on times five magnification. Engaging students with the community. Only to possess knowledge and intellectual capacities. Hi, my name is Brett. I'm going to show you how I use the Kurzweil text reader to read textbooks while I'm at college. So I've got the Paul voice chosen. I'm going to start reading the textbook, which is an anatomy textbook. The heart is a four-chambered organ slightly left of the sternum. That's a little bit too fast, so I'm going to slow it down to about 120 words a minute. Sternum. The two upper chambers of the heart are the atria. If I don't like the voice, I can change it to another voice, like Kate. Atria. The two lower chambers of the heart are the ventricles. As I go through, I can do something like highlight. So I can take the yellow highlight and highlight the word, the ventricles. I can take green and I'll go to the atria. I did too much there, so I'll erase it. and get the atria to highlight. Or add a footnote or a sticky of the heart. I can zoom in going up to about 400%. If I need to look closer, and go back out to 150% go through and look up definitions, synonyms, syllables, jump around pages quickly. So. And as you can see, the text notes are still there. So I can go later on and extract them, and it'll come to a file for me. So everything I'll highlight will come out. The next thing I can do is show them side by side so I can look at how the text compares to my notes. So tile vertically and see my notes here, go over and find where it is in the, in the text itself. I really love Kurzweil because it allows me to read books at a faster speed. It will read it to me while I'm studying and it helps me focus a lot better.
Another thing, it really helps when professors choose their textbooks early so that I can get my textbook turned into electronic form so that I can read it on time for class. Okay, we won't, we won't get into JAWS um, in the interest of time and because I think I've described it. And Again, JAWS is a screen reader that allows a blind student to read uh, the material on the computer screen as well as to manipulate the, the uh, screen. Uh, I quickly just want to refer you to uh, CATS Web, which again is the website for the CUNY Assistive Technology Services Project. Um, there's a, there are sections on a variety of topics which are along the navigation bar up here on the top. But this particular section is really relevant for today's presentation uh, because it, um, it's about assistive technology. So uh, we've got links that uh, show some of the products that are actually used on this campus and other campuses with descriptions and uh, the rationale and the type of student that would benefit from using this product. Um, so that if you do have a student in your class with a tape recorder without an obvious disability um, and of course this is all private and, and so uh, you might not know what the reason is for the, for the recorder. Th this can give you a sense of what type of student would be benefiting from um, using that particular device. So I invite you to visit this page. Uh, we have uh, a lot of really relevant information here. This digital smart pen is actually a tool that we're using on campus in a uh, remedial math class. And this is very early and not scientifically vetted yet in terms of research, but we're seeing some real benefit to uh, the comprehension and passing uh, rates in those classes. Now, of course, the pen alone, I don't think is the reason for it. It's done in conjunction with our tutoring, which SSD does for remedial courses. Um, but there, there are some indications that something's happening with the use of this technology. So it provides access, yes, and I'll very quickly show you how it does that. Uh, what, wrong click. Uh, let's close that. Um, where is that? Uh, well, that's not taking me where I want to go. All right, some, something happened in the development of this. Oh, here it is. There we go. We're using the Echo Smart Pen. Uh, it's the same as the Sky Smart Pen, except that the Sky is wireless, Wi-Fi. Right? Everything's wireless now. Um, and this is a two-minute video, so. This is the Echo Smart Pen from Livescribe. It's a computer and a pen, and it works like this. The Smart Pen starts recording everything you write and hear. Write notes during a meeting or lecture. Draw diagrams. Mark important information. To replay, just tap your notes and high quality audio plays back from that exact moment. You can jump forward or go back to notes from days, months, even years ago. All right, goals. Ready? Here we go. The Echo Smart Pen connects to your PC or Mac computer by USB cable to transfer your notes and audio to Livescribe Desktop. After the transfer, your digital notes and audio come to life as an interactive document called a pencast. Pencasts allow you to hear, see, and relive your notes exactly as they were recorded. Or other small device. To search your handwritten notes, type in any word. Livescribe Desktop searches for every place that word appears in your writing. Stay organized with custom notebooks by combining pages from different notebooks. Notes can be transcribed into typed text by downloading an app that's sold separately. You can even share your notes and audio as an interactive PDF, accessible by anyone with the latest Adobe Reader. The Echo Smart Pen. It's time your notes worked for you. And of course, that was produced by the manufacturer, so it's got that commercial feel to it. But I thought it was uh, important for you to know about this tool because it can be used across disability types and in, for a variety of uh, benefits to students. Um, I didn't show you the iVail video, but the Kurzweil tool particularly is a multimodal uh, assistive technology, meaning that 
When a student uses it, they'll read visually, they can hear the audio of the text being read, you can highlight portions, paragraphs, and sentences to add emphasis, and all these input methods allow for greater comprehension and longer retention and at the end of the day better learning which is again tied to the universal design principles. Research has been done obviously which supports this. We won't get into this because there's another video I, want, I really want you to see um, and it's a little longer than what we've shown already. Having said all this, your mileage may vary, right? Uh, it depends on many factors. Uh, having assistive technology is not a guarantee of access. If a faculty person scans a, a document into a PDF and they create an image that's not accessible by a screen reader. Because screen readers are great, but they have no intelligence. They can only read what's in an accessible format. So it depends on designing uh, with accessibility in mind. Uh, it, de it depends on IT supporting the tools that have to work in our environment. And it depends on having a sense that we are creating, again, our materials with every learner in mind. And it's not as hard or complicated as it sounds. So, again, your mileage may vary. It requires collaboration. It requires that we and IT and the computing center and faculty and students talk to each other and work together and, and collaborate using this perfect example of this series of workshops. This was a faculty initiated um, series of workshops and here we are bringing together some of the leaders in the university um, to push and to educate each other. On, on accessibility and the, and, the, and the ways and means of getting there. So, IT, IT, AT, IT faculty and administrators, if we get it together, we can provide accessible uh, instruction and successful inc outcomes. Now, this is a video which I really want you to see, and I'll just make a, a real quick introduction. It's a wonderful video. It's a great video. And, it, and they're talking about accessibility. And after we saw it a few times, we were like, yeah, we want to use it. And after I incorporated it into the presentation, I watched it again when I realized it wasn't video captioned. So even the best intentions with a co collaborative uh, um, effort, we sometimes miss it. But to the rescue were, were the CATS team, and they grabbed the video, and they did the captioning with a really easy to use tool that some faculty might even consider using themselves. Portland Community College okay, Ash Mozilla Firefox. Portland and Community College. Portland. App. Do not show me the dialog box again. Checkbox not checked. The check I'm press app. Dead. Yes button to activate. Press space. My PCC vertical app. Skip navigation app. Portal logo graphics app. Imagine that you're trying to do homework online and this is what you had to deal with. App. Email app. Group app. Help app. Blog app. My piece app. My app. I'm sight impaired and uh, I have RP, which is retinitis pigmentosa and it's as if I'm looking through straws. Uh, for a sighted student, uh, they can just see what's there on the page and click on whatever they need and they can go back and forth to the syllabus and back to the page very easily. I have to navigate back and forth and run up and down the page with a JAWS program that takes a lot longer. Today, everyone uses computers, and PCC students use computers extensively to access online content via the web. But for students with a disability, this can present enormous challenges that we really need to address. Daniel Turnbull is one of our students who faces enormous obstacles due to his visual disability. The, the major that I've chosen is psychology. Uh, I want to be a uh, counselor for people with um, disabilities. I'm Kendra Colley. 
I'd like to talk with you today about implementing some new standards to ensure that all of our online content is accessible to all of our students. I think the, the frustration that I observe with students with disabilities is that they can't, they can't complete the assignments. They've got this time set aside and they're not able to do the work. You see other students participating in the discussion, you want to participate, you have a limited time to participate, but you can't do that because you haven't been able to watch the film that you need to watch in order to participate. Some of the problems that I have are that there are no captions, that there are no transcripts available. So if it's not captioned, they should at least have a file available so that I can read what's being said and then try to fit that in with the video, read it at the same time that I'm watching the video. Well, I have to work more closely with my instructors and see if either they can give me um, another assignment or if something that I can learn from another video or sometimes I need to set up time with an interpreter to meet with them and have them interpret the videos sit down with them and have them interpret the videos so it's almost pointless because sometimes I have to come here to campus anyway even though I'm taking a class that's supposed to be on online I don't like having to go and get my counts a counselor or uh, get disability assistance to come and help me because all I need is just just the voice the voice that's on video to be captioned. I should be able to email the instructor and they should be able to to ha ha fix it right away because other students can listen to their assignments, can listen to the information that's on the internet, and if the instructor um, notices that there's something wrong with the audio, they can fix it right away. If if there's no um, captioning, you know, on the video, then we're not going to be learning anything from what you're saying on uh, the video. So it's very important that you um, have captioning um, because we can really be involved, you know, what's happening in the world and in classrooms or whatever. It's very important. Um, my goal is to get a PhD in physics or math. Because I'm physically impaired, I can't use my hands. Um, I use the computer exclusively to do my homework and to access content from PCC. It is my connection to the outside world. It uh, connects me to my family, my friends, to the school. Um, Without a computer, um, I would be pretty much stuck. The most frustrating thing that I've encountered um, at PCC are the PDFs that you have to download instead of being able to fill out the form online. Because once I download the file, I have to find someone to fill it out for me, which could take uh, days. It's frustrating um, when a lot of the websites time out on you and I have to re-log in multiple times. People that use the computer use the mouse all the time and um, don't really recognize the fact that without a mouse, the the computer is very hard to use and dragging and dropping is almost impossible to do with the mouse stick without the use of your hands. So any um, program that you need to drag and drop is almost inaccessible to someone with a disability. I am picking a time that I want the light flash and solving for negative K at this point. When I'm taking tests at school, they give me three times the amount of time that a regular student has to take the test. And it's not because I need more time to think about it, it's all entering the data into the computer. The, the reason we need to be ready for these changes is not just because of the laws, but 
you as an instructor have to think about when a student comes to your class. Are you going to say to them, I'm sorry, um, you can't watch the video. We have, to, we have to make sure all of our classes are accessible to everyone. It just, it just makes sense. Helping all of our students reach their educational goals is a shared responsibility. The Departments of Instructional Support and Distance Learning have been working on guidelines and information about how this can be done more easily. It's not so difficult. For example, course materials can be designed so that they're easily accessible. The Departments of Instructional Support and Distance Learning will be here to provide training, provide support, provide some of the, uh, the actual technical pieces of doing things such as putting captioning on videos. Um, anything to make sure that all of the materials that go online are accessible. We'll be starting with new courses. So as courses are, are developed for an online environment, the materials need to be made accessible. I believe that as an instructor, I want my students to be successful. I want to give them the tools necessary for them to achieve. And this is one of the ways. This ensures that all students have the opportunity to be successful and not just those students that don't have a disability. It does matter because everybody should be included and nobody should be excluded for any reason. So even though it's a small portion of the population of the school, they have every right to be successful as anyone else. There are a lot of disabilities out there, some that we're aware of and some that we're not aware of. So I think the changes we make for the students who have real strong barriers will help the students with maybe lesser barriers or students who have no identified barriers at all. So I do think that the changes we make will, will help our courses just be more accessible to all students. I mean, I think you as a teacher need to decide, are you going to open the door or are you going to shut the door? Are you going to provide an academic experience for somebody or not? Okay, I know we have a couple minutes left, so I just want to quickly run through this. Uh, bear with us. Thank you for your patience. Um, so how can we help? Well, again, use captioned videos or podcasts. Uh, create accessible PDFs. Uh, if you can provide electronic versions of your class materials, fantastic. You probably produce them on a computer, so it doesn't follow that they only should be provided on hard copies, right? There's email and all sorts of other cool electronic uh, tools you can use. If you're creating a web page, use a descriptive alt text tag. Simply saying tree under an image of a tree isn't really helpful if you're trying to make a point that it's a, I don't know, palm tree and it's relevant to whatever reason you inserted that image. Um, if you uh, are creating Word documents, use um, table headers. This makes it extremely easy for a student using a screen reader to navigate that document. Um, you know, simply hitting enter after every line is not really the best way of creating a document. And some of us do that and there are some really simple to learn tools uh, built into Word that you can use to make your materials uh, more accessible. There are actually accessibility guidelines provided by Blackboard, which you can download from their website. And um, th it's not a very thick, uh, dense document. It's helpful, and I think would benefit you if you are, uh, with, like most of you, uh, hosting courses or providing information on Blackboard. Um, call CATS. We can help with uh, more resources. And speaking of resources, in this packet that you can download from our website, I've included a variety of resources. We're located in the Science Building in the SSD office. And um, please feel free to come by, uh, email, call. Um, that's our website, that's our URL. So if you want to download any of the materials, that's the place to go. You can tour the website, offer suggestions, criticism, and, criticisms, and or contributions. Uh, we're always trying to expand the amount of useful information on, webs on, on CATS web. We were going to link, we're going to link to the videos of this workshop to Amy uh, Traver's uh, page, which is on the Queensboro website, so that you have access to the previous uh, uh, seri uh, workshops of the series. And those will be captioned as well. Um, so all of this material that I've included is going to be on the website. On April 5th, 
CUNY is hosting its uh, fourth annual accessibility conference and we invite you all. It's a free conference. Lunch will be served and um, it will be bringing together a variety of leaders and uh, professionals from the assistive technology field, including uh, disability services folks, vendors, uh, AT specialists, and um, it would be well worth your, you coming to John Jay College on April 5th from 9 to 2 p.m. It's free, and you'll meet uh, some of other folks who are in, doing the same sort of work that you're doing. So please register at, again at Cats Web is the registration link. Um, I'll just run through these quickly. National Center Access IT is a wonderful site for you to visit, as is the Access Project. AHEAD, I'm sure you're familiar with, which is the leading organization on higher ed and disability in the country. Um, Apple has some wonderful tools for accessibility. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, iOS products, um, please make sure you visit. There's some links as well that you can um, go to. They've got a, a book authoring project, which is relatively simple to use, which would allow you to create instructional materials um, I know you say books, and that's a kind of scary concept, but uh, the demonstration they gave us shows how really straightforward and easy it is for you to create material that you can incorporate in your coursework, in your courses. Here's the Blackboard Accessibility Guide that you can download. And uh, Baruch College hosts something called the Center for Visually Impaired Persons, and they're also a great resource at, in CUNY. CASI, again, is the, the Council of All the Disability Services Directors, and they fund CATS along with other projects. The Reasonable Accommodations Guide is a publication of the CASI group, which you can also download from CATS Web, and there's some hard copies here if you haven't picked one up, but you, if you want to refer any of your colleagues to it, they can download this in a PDF format. Uh, Landmark College, we've heard of. There's a LD project, Learning Disabilities project, that is now hosted at Ostos Community College, and they've, they're providing a variety of services to students with learning disabilities. And um, Project REACH is the university's new project. On, um, they're doing research on autism and students with autism to help better serve the growing population of students on the spectrum. And they're located in, uh, on 31st Street at the City University offices there. And um, thank you for attending. Uh, I hope there's, uh, there's been useful information provided to you today. Please call on us, and uh, we'd be happy to help and collaborate in the future. And there we go. Oh, and uh, playtime, if you like, with the, the assistive technology in the front. I don't know if you have time, but we'll, we'll stick around. <laughs>